Okay, I think we can get going. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we are joined today by Dr. Needy Goel to discuss diversity in clinical trials. Dr. Goel is the adjunct assistant professor of medicine at the Duke University School of Medicine, as well as chief medical officer of, of Curo. Thank you and welcome, or welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And I wanted to give a shout out to the um, National Psoriasis Foundation for inviting me to give this talk. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and so again, happy to speak to it. Um, this talk is more focused overall on psoriatic disease. So I wanted to just give everybody that um, disclaimers, as you will, but uh, I think it applies in many ways to other clinical trials as well. So let's get started. Um, so I think first of all, um, just to let you know what the objectives of the discussion are, uh, would like to define diversity, equity, inclusion, and then highlight the following with respect to DEI. So what is DEI and then the past clinical trials in psoriatic disease and, and what what are the issues related to DEI and psoriatic disease? Then um, in general, common questions, challenges, and concerns participants may have regarding joining a clinical trial. Ensuring informed consent is a shared decision-making process. Best practices for recruitment and communication related to diversity, equity, and inclusion and a brief list of resources and information to keep abreast of relevant trials. My understanding is, is that um, this webinar will be available for a year after today's presentation. And um, I source all the data on the slides themselves in terms of the references, but also just a quick list at the end related to where you can go to find more information related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and in clinical trials. So diversity is any dimension that can be used to differentiate groups and people from one another. So, you know, sometimes we think about race and ethnicity as the most common elements of diversity, but really it encompasses several um, dimensions in terms of it can also address age, sex, sexual orientation, gender, um, race, um, color, ethnicity, as I mentioned, but also genetics, religion, disability, education, income, national origin, and even in medical care, especially residents. So um, rural individuals often have less access to healthcare versus urban individuals. Equity is an interesting concept. Um, it is not equality, and I just want to make sure people understand that. Um, and I have a picture showing how equity differs from equality coming up, but everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. So it requires removing obstacles to good health um, and the consequences of doing that. Um, and so, for example, um, or the consequences of obstacles. So for example, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay may be something that contributes to um, not being able to achieve good health. And then inclusion is an environment in which groups or individuals having different backgrounds are accepted, welcomed, and equally treated. So this is a cartoon that demonstrates the difference from um, in between equality and equity. So you can see here where everybody gets the same bicycle but struggles to potentially use the same bicycle, whereas equity addresses getting um, a bicycle that suits your needs so that you can ride a bicycle just as well as anybody else. So to equalize opportunities, those with worse health and fewer resources may need more to be expended on their behalf to improve their health. So if we go into um, what does psoriatic disease look like in the US by some of the things we might use 
to evaluate um, differences between people. So if we look at the overall population um, in terms of it being 100%, the overall prevalence of psoriatic um, or psoriasis is about 1.4 to 3.2%. And the prevalence in psoriasis of psoriatic arthritis is 19% in the US um, and zero to 42% worldwide. Um, some of the differences have to do with, for example, Northern climes tend to have more evidence of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis um, than for example, Southern climes. Um, female male prevalence is pretty similar, um, whether you're looking at psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, um, there is, some element of, uh, of course, the U.S. population 76 is 76% 76 white. Um, the psoriasis prevalence may be a bit higher in the Caucasian population, um, but the psoriatic arthritis prevalence is probably a bit higher in those of African American or Asian backgrounds. And then unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information related to indigenous individuals, mixed individuals, or Latinx individuals. Um, you can see slightly lower prevalence of disease, but um, I've had it told to me that this is just a white person's disease and it's not. It still has a fairly significant presence in other racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, so overall, the things that we need um, to address are to get more data related to these diseases in terms of prevalence, especially for psoriatic arthritis. Um, the other thing to consider is that the data related to African Americans, Asians, Latinx may be lower than the actual um, prevalence of the disease in the community because these individuals are often underrepresented in both census data as well as disease evaluation data. And um, there is some degree of variability as you can see, for example, on the African-Americans where the psoriasis prevalence is, ranges from a half to 2%. And that uh, can be because of the use of different data sets and different ascertainment methods to try to determine the prevalence. So clinical trial diversity, why does it matter? So as I stated, racial and ethnic minorities are historically underrepresented in overall data sets, even um, those that are just observational or registries or what have you, but also specifically in clinical trials. And I'll show you some data to support that related to psoriatic disease. We do need representation of these individuals, however, to study effects of therapeutic interventions um, in the people who will ultimately use them. Persons of different ages, races, and ethnicities could react differently to certain medical products. And there are several instances um, related to medications across um, several therapeutic classes where this is certainly true. And then it also helps provide an understanding of health disparities when we see such data, such that we get an idea of diseases that may occur more frequently or may have different presentations in diverse populations. So this is just an overall picture where um, some of the data, again, even related to underrepresentation in clinical trials is limited. The FDA has started to address that, which is really nice. But if we look at 2011 data, the overall population is 12% African American and 16% Hispanic. And we only have in clinical trials across the clinical trial spectrum, only 5% of the people coming in being African American and 1% Hispanic. So we're not getting good data overall in um, diversity with respect to people of color. Um, as I mentioned, the FDA is doing more to address diversity and providing data 
over time. So here we can see, and now this is a specific website on um, the FDA's overall website um, where they're doing something called drug trial snapshots. And it allows one to see the number of participants by age, sex, race, ethnicity, and location um, that have contributed to the approval of both an individual product, but overall as well in the United States by year. So we can see on average, women um, are a little bit more um, represented than men. Um, whites are overall significantly represented. And if you remember, you know, about 16% of the population of the US is African-American. And um, so we do have underrepresentation of African-Americans, probably quite a bit better in terms of Hispanics, um, good in terms of the age of 65 and older. So overall, um, you know, we're starting to be able to get an idea of what the data look like in terms of diversity and who's entering clinical trials. Hopefully we will see as time goes on and efforts improve that the numbers of uh, people of color and ethnicity are better represented in the overall data sets. In terms of reporting of race and ethnicity specifically in clinical trials of psoriasis, um, by race, we are seeing that the majority of patients are um, reported, or most of the trials are reporting either multiple categories, but there are still about 15% of the trials that are not reporting any data related to race at all. And we'll see a similar pattern when we look at the trials of psoriatic arthritis. And then we are only seeing two thirds of the trials um, or two thirds of the trials are not reporting any data related to ethnicity. And yet, um, you know, the FDA, if the trial is approved in the US, um, indicates that they want these data um, overall for all clinical trials. Now, one thing I just want to provide as a caveat is that for approved drugs, those data may be provided specifically to the FDA so they can be found in the public domain, but they're not in the publications, which is how most of us look for information related to this. This is a more busy slide, but looking at um, multiple clinical trials in psoriatic arthritis, so double-blind randomized controlled top trials published between 2004 and 2020 of targeted therapeutics for psoriatic arthritis. So really comprising all of the trials that have been done um, to support the approval of various therapeutics within psoriatic arthritis um, since 2004. And um, what we see is that the publications didn't report Hispanic or Latino status. If you look closely at the slide, um, the, or the studies that have a little bit more um, ethnic representation typically have it because they included patients in Asian countries, but also potentially um, Latin American based countries. That said, when you looked at the actual data, when there was more diversity, it was usually due to the enrollment of Asian patients. Um, and when you looked at the specific racial reporting, black race was reported in only 30% of the trials and comprised less than 1% of participants and Asian or other was reported in half the trials, but comprised less than 10% of the population evaluated in most studies. And um, representation by race and ethnicity overall was lower than that of the prevalence of non-white individuals in the US. So we should be doing a lot better job, both in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis to ensure representation of people of color.
So what are the factors that influence um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and clinical research? Um, many of them are driven by the participants themselves, but also referring physicians, the investigators and site staff, the influence of friends and family, the sponsor themselves for of the study, and other. <laughs> There's always a basket for other. So what are some of the barriers that exist to clinical trial participation by, minority, my, by minorities? And this is more in reference to how do the participants feel about um, participation in a clinical trial? And so um, we'll speak a little bit more about some of these elements, but there's mistrust, lack of information, lack of access to clinical trials, Always, in, for anyone in a clinical trial, there's time and resource constraints, and there's also the concern about unintended outcomes. So what are the elements of mistrust that occur? Um, so there's a feeling that research will benefit whites or Caucasians or the institution itself and not people of color. If you recall, many people have heard about, for example, the Tuskegee experiment. And so intrinsically, there's some element of feeling like a guinea pig. So that's one of the things um, that prevents people from participating. They also feel like sometimes the research agenda doesn't serve the overall community and certain people of color um, look at research as how can it benefit the overall community rather than the individual. So if they don't feel that the community is being served then they, they don't think it's worthwhile research and they mistrust the agenda of the research. Um, they also feel that informed consent means that they're giving up their rights, even though informed consents indicate that, you know, things are voluntary. It doesn't mean their rights are um, relinquished, um, and they also feel that it provides a researcher with legal protection against any harm. There's a disregard for cultural norms many a time where they don't respect um, how their personal beliefs and or what their culture um, wants. There's also an element of the investigator doesn't look like me, um, although actually there are not really good data that I could find to support that um, African-Americans, for example, want an African-American physician. There are, there's lots of evidence in social media, for example, and in general that that is a desired outcome. And part of the research issues related to race and ethnicity, and we'll see this again in the presentation, may be that there's not enough of the workforce represented in terms of people of color as well. And so um, they don't, for example, African-Americans may not have the knowledge of what it feels like to be taken care of by an African-American because there's just not that many African-American physicians. And then there's also general concerns regarding how the data will be used, um, if they're getting improper treatment, disclosure, ethical practices, and then reputation of the researcher institution may also play into it. In terms of lack of information, there's misconceptions about research, limited knowledge about trials, lack of materials that may be translated, um, and then language barriers themselves and intimidation by English, low perceived risk of disease. So some of the people don't think that they have disease serious enough requiring treatment and or because they don't personally feel like their disease is serious enough, they may not even go to a physician to be evaluated for their disease. They also think that research participation is not necessary, that they have no idea that we don't, we, we wouldn't have the medications that we have available today were it not for research. And then they um, don't easily understand how to access research and research results. 
Um, and that also plays into lack of access, um, but minorities are less likely to be approached about research and there are data sets that support that as well as provided therapeutic options or even diagnosed and they have less access in general to healthcare for a multitude of reasons. There's also time and resource constraints. I think any of us that do clinical trials understand that, but this is true for pretty much every participant, but it may be um, overrepresented in people of color, but there's inconvenience, there's the cost of participation. One of the big things is lack of time. You know, unfortunately, many of these folks in our society may be um, holding two or more jobs. They have lack of childcare, lack of transportation, lack of cell phone and or internet access. And then um, they may also, some clinical trials um, depend on, for example, insurance coverage of background therapies. And so if that doesn't exist, that may um, make the clinical trial not accessible to the participant. And then of course, unintended uh, consequences to some uh, there's a concern of stigma and family opinions and judgment that goes back to how does the community feel about the research. There's also privacy and confidentiality concerns. Um, what does their health history that they have to disclose mean? And the genetics um, aspects where, you know, people are concerned about what the genetics might tell them um, that they didn't want to know. Um, and uncertainty regarding the risks of the medications, as well as the effectiveness of them, and uh, definitely concerns about side effects. Um, for some individuals, um, for especially the Latinx community, there's a concern that they may be deported if they um, make themselves available to research. And also similar to um, genetics, if they find out that they have a disease or learn more about their disease, they may not want that in terms of um, knowledge. So what can we do to overcome some of these participant barriers? I think we can do a better job explaining research studies. We can reinforce personal health. We can ensure that patient safety or try to explain safety in ways that they understand. So instead of just saying one in a hundred, there have been studies that show giving a pictogram where, for example, you show one person in red and you show 99 people um, in green for, you know, just in a cartoon kind of drawing that uh, people grasp that concept much better about the risk. And like if it's one in a hundred. Confirm clear information is provided for decision-making so that they understand the decisions they're making and that they get the information they need to make those decisions. Emphasize support and access to resources. Ensure culturally congruent study designs and re recruitment practices. So, um, you know, if if they're more of a church going community, maybe you go, for example, to the churches to recruit, or you speak to the community overall to tell people um, regarding the research so that they better understand um, for the individual that may be the participant, what the benefits may be to that participant. Eliminate conscious and unconscious bias and racism. I think this in some ways is a little bit hard to do, but if people bring it to the forefront, it may be more likely to be something that they can overcome. Definitely show appreciation for involvement. And then um, I think we do fall down on this. We may provide results overall in publications to the medical community, but we're not very good about providing results to individual participants and or the communities post the research study. Um, in terms of some of this, the explaining, explain research studies, what is the basis of the available therapies, why the person might be a good research participant, and to just emphasize that we need all kinds of people enrolled in the research to give us the most information. Reinforce the personal health, that 
health and safety are important, will be monitored, and that they may see medical individuals more frequently. And, you know, sometimes that can be a downside. They don't want that in terms of the time commitment, but on the other hand, that they will see them frequently to be monitored frequently. Um, and then ensure the safety. Um, explain that the medication has already been evaluated in animals before it even gets to human, and that the medical staff will pay close attention for side effects and reinforcing that, you know, if they have some untoward symptoms, how they might contact the medical staff and or when they should go to the emergency room. Clear information needs to be provided. So jargon needs to be removed. You might wanna provide um, a fax booklet in terms of what the purpose of the study is, procedures, um, et cetera, in language that's easy to understand. Offer, if the patient wants it, to include a family or friend in the decision-making process. Offer to keep the personal physician informed, such if the patient wants it, then that can happen explain the potential benefits of the study, and most importantly, that participation is voluntary. Emphasize the support and access to resources, so contact information as I provided, but more importantly, the availability of language appropriate phone prompts. So are your prompts um, at your clinic? also in Spanish as well as English, or also in some of the more frequent Asian languages, um, depending on your community and how many people in that community may need that benefit. Um, provide workplace support via the employer, um, if that's a necessary place to um, provide that, but also support for childcare and transportation flexible hours, so evening hours or weekend hours, telemedicine is another way. Um, one of the good things that has arisen because of COVID is um, the rise of telehealth in a much more rapid manner, as well as the concept of decentralized trials has come into reality where people are more likely to use home health visits and site flexibility to um, address patient needs and participant needs to participate in studies. And then if necessary, a hotel or some place to stay um, if there are frequent, especially when there are frequent visits involved or just any visit if, if the patient is coming from a long distance. Provide a cell phone as needed if there's uh, if the uh, participant lacks one and may need to contact the site. Make sure that medical records can be exchanged with proper consent, and then um, provide proper remuneration for the patient's time and or you know, if they can access an Uber or Lyft, that that's not at their own expense, that that's covered by the study reimbursements. Uh, the culturally congruent study designs and recruitment, I already mentioned some of this um, with the phones, but also translated materials that the informed consent and other trial documents are in lay language. Recruitment is on their terms. So if they prefer face-to-face -face versus digital recruitment, if they prefer community settings, if they re prefer it through referring physicians or appropriate media outlets. Use a wide variety of investigational sites. So um, many times go to the common urban centers, but some of those may not address, for example, rural populations or um, because again, we tend to have um, limitations in terms of uh, diversity representation within the medical workforce. There may not be that um, cache of minority investigators to um, target as potential investigators, but trying to recruit those individuals for clinical trial investigation may be of significant benefit. And then um, another thing to consider is undergoing cultural competency and proficiency training. Do you understand personally what you need to do to um, increase diversity within your clinical trial setting?
So um, switching gears a little bit, what is shared decision-making? Um, you know, much of medical care when I grew up was paternalistic. Uh, the physician basically told you what to do. You didn't really have a choice. And then your choice was that you either chose to do it or not personally. But it wasn't um, a discussion about how you might make a choice that works for you and the physician presenting all the information that you may need or healthcare provider providing all the um, information you may need to make a decision. Um, and that really relates to the amount and quality of information received and the level of involvement in the decision-making process. That said, shared decision-making tends to be absent when there is an issue of high certainty. So the example I provided is where you have treatment of a gunshot wound, you're just gonna let the doctor usually make the decisions to manage that versus when there's a situation of uncertainty, like two or more choices. So for example, receiving treatment in a clinical trial or receiving treatment that you may have available to you by insurance or which treatment you receive might also be an element of uncertainty where you then need more shared decision-making processes in place. So what are the benefits of shared decision-making? And then specifically informed consent. So, you know, informed consent should be a give and take process where patients are given or participants are given the informed consent document, but it really is a discussion about what the benefits or the risks of participating in the clinical trial are, what their other options are, and then whether or not the participant chooses to become enrolled in the clinical trial. But for that individual, it does increase involvement in the decision-making process, their knowledge and understanding. And I have several personal um, examples of where if you tell an individual the why, they're more likely to want to participate. They're more likely to be compliant with their medications, um, et cetera. They also are better, better informed regarding the risks. It helps them identify better the high risk decisions. They have more realistic expectations from the treatment. Um, you know, that if the treatment fails, they're not surprised that the treatment has failed. Decisions and choices that align with their own preferences and values that they have shared responsibility and in having that shared responsibility have more ownership for the decision. It has been shown to improve satisfaction, improve, as I mentioned, compliance or adherence to treatment, and in some cases that health outcomes are improved. It also, if this is the norm or becomes the norm, and it should be the norm, helps reduce variations in care um, overall. So what are some of the tools that have been developed to help with um, diversity in uh, clinical trials? And there was a tool developed uh, called the diversity site assessment tool to evaluate uh, clinical sites that participate in clinical trials and how ready they are to really recognize and improve diversity representation within clinical trials. So overall, this tool has 25 questions, which looks at the site overall, what the recruitment and outre outreach processes are, what the patient-focused services are, what their background is, and the answers are on a quantitative scale where higher scores are better. So you do this self-assessment um, based on the cartoon on the right, and you identify your strengths and weaknesses, you discuss how you might solve them, and then you implement the solutions. And then you, this is a constant process, not just done once, but it should be something that's done on a regular basis to continue to reevaluate what the opportunities are to improve. So I don't mean for you to read this slide, um, but it's just in there for reference. 
as is the resource for it, but basically looking at some of the questions in terms of site overview is that does the site even know the demographic makeup of their own community to then understand who could they possibly recruit and then do the percentages of whatever diversity aspect they're looking at, is that reflected in the population they're actually recruiting within a trial? How do they do recruitment and outreach so they have an already established tailored strategy to approach populations for clinical trials? So those are some of the examples of questions available on the DSAT for the site to evaluate themselves. And again, with the patient-focused services, as I mentioned, informed consent form is available in various translations and already approved for use in those languages. Um, the FDA has also been um, increasingly recognized the need for diversity in clinical trial populations and, and states that enrolling pop participants with a wide range of baseline characteristics may create a study population that more accurately reflects the patients likely to take the drug and allows the assessment um, of those characteristics on the safety and effectiveness. So their guidance indicates some of the things that need to be done to improve diversity in clinical trials. So broaden the eligibility criteria population um, to be brought in through adaptive trial or enrichment strategies, make trial participation less burdensome. So things like time and resources become less of an issue for a clinical trial participant and expand access to clinical trials. And that goes back to some of the things that I said about um, increasing the number of locations and or for example, minority investigators that may um, participate in the trials so that their populations can be adequately represented. So um, again, switching gears, but the basics of a clinical trial for a new therapeutic in psoriatic disease, you know, and how do we make sure that diversity, equality, inclusion is a part of our psoriatic trial? So in doing so, we have to think about the various stages in which we need to keep thinking about how are we going to make sure DEI is a part of the study. So the first step is planning. Um, and then there are opportunities during the development of the protocol to do so. There are opportunities in terms of the trial approval. So for example, as part of that, um, do you have informed consents in um, Spanish, for example, available in the US? Also during the trial conduct, so this goes back to recruitment and also does the site understand and um, try to recruit diverse patients. And then the reporting of results, as I, you know, as I showed you in the beginning of the talk, very few of the results um, even um, report, you know, many of the publications don't even report the ethnicity or the racial makeup of the populations enrolled. So planning, um, you know, just as just an overview of what clinical trials are and the types and who might be involved in the planning. But I did wanna emphasize patient research partners should be involved in the planning of any research study that involves humans. And there are plenty of data sets to support that when patients themselves are involved, often the clinical trial results and outcomes that are reported are much more relevant to patients. And there's less misunderstanding of the differences in terms of what physicians report as well versus what patients report in the clinical trial. So um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but protocol content, again, this is just to educate folks on what is included in a protocol in terms of um, what we describe and place. So basically the treatment, 
detailed descriptions of the trial designs, what are the methods by which we're going to evaluate patients, general information such as who's sponsoring the trial and the investigator themselves, and then regulatory, which talks about financing, insurance related to the study, how data handling and privacy is addressed, and how quality controls um, are addressed as well. So um, we have to sit back, those of us that are involved in designing clinical trials, but also those of us who review them for um, diversity issues is in general, trial design has focused on homogeneity so we, that we can best assess what the drug is doing um, rather than all the things that might confound the evaluation of the therapeutic. So diversity has been often framed as a deviation from the homogeneous population, which has been traditionally considered the white male. Um, with some exception, you know, actually men are discriminated against, so to speak, in studies of breast cancer. So if the disease is primarily um, present in women, for example, then they tend to be overrepresented in a trial. But um, taking a step back, that tends to not be the norm versus it is the norm. Um, so note that different effects are not always seen in diverse groups, but if there was a difference, we need to figure out how we might detect that difference. And it begins by ensuring that we enroll a diverse population. We should consider a broad range of relevant factors. So not just people of color, but biological, genetic, sociocultural, economic, psychological, and behavioral factors, which may impact efficacy and safety. And then um, the other thing to consider is that patient reported instruments, so where we're doing questionnaires, may not have been developed or validated in diverse populations. So they may not properly represent um, the questions that would be relevant to them. So don't design trials with the same inclusion and exclusion criteria just because that is how it was always done. Um, remember that eligibility criteria may disproportionately exclude minorities on the basis of, for example, comorbidities, which are tend to be overrepresented in people of color, in part because of poor access to health care. Um, engage early with advocacy groups, experts, and people with the disease, including representatives from diverse populations. And from those engagements, elicit suggestions for the study design, obtain advice on recruitment materials, and get input on disease-specific or community-specific um, educational resources that might be needed. In terms of trial approvals um, in the process, the goal is to ensure that the research is justified and safe you submit the protocol to the ethics committee and regulatory bodies, ethics committees will determine um, the suitability of the research staff as well as the protocol and that the risk benefit balance is in favor of benefits. Also that the information given to participants is sufficient, how recruitment will occur is acceptable and that the support for the trial can be um, properly provided, as well as uh, continuing to evaluate the safety of individuals during the study. And then trial conduct and results, make sure during and after the study, you establish the diversity recruitment goals, create a retention plan, obtain proxy contact information is important. So if you have a patient who's quote unquote lost a follow-up, maybe they've lost their telephone service or their email service. And so is there someone else that you can get information for at the beginning of the trial to reach, to try to reach the study participant? Make sure that they can follow up at the end of the study, even if they withdraw early, do subgroup analyses of the study, report results by diversity metrics, and address differences and missing data, especially if it seems to be more prevalent in a specific subgroup 
for example, based on race or age. Consider the use in terms of recruitment of electronic health or claims data to identify sites and or um, diverse participants. Make available an extension study with broader inclusion criteria to encourage participation. We know that um, studies with extensions often recruit better, but make sure that all will have access to the investigational treatment, not just placebo. So um, this is one of the last slides in the talk, but I have referenced it during the discussion that workforce diversity is also a problem. And so um, in terms of our workforce, it also doesn't tend to match that of the racial and ethnic makeup of the US. And in fact, in this setting, Asians are overrepresented whites are a little bit less represented, um, but there's a significant number that are unknown. And as you can see, um, Blacks and Hispanics are underrepresented in relationship to the diverse makeup of the US. Um, and some of the barriers to the development of minority healthcare providers is even access to medical education, where medical education has become so expensive that um, people often can't even get uh, to go to medical school because they don't have the finances to address it. And or we also know that there tends to be underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minorities even getting into undergraduate uh, colleges for uh, to even make it to be able to go to medical school, for example. There is also issues with race and ethnicity in terms of mentorship and development. There's also racism and stereotyping well reported by peers, superiors, as well as patients. And then there are lower rates of promotion in academic environments. And all of these things serve as barriers to increasing workforce diversity. And they are things that we need to work on. So in conclusion, and again, thank you for your time. And I hope that this talk has helped um, highlight some of the ways that we can improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical trials. But trials of new therapeutics and psoriatic disease are at the moment not racially or ethnically diverse even though we know that uh, the disease is well represented in ethnic and racial subgroups. Many interventions and tools exist, however, to identify and address barriers to the inclusion of diverse individuals in psoriatic disease trials. Also shared decision-making is an important aspect of the informed consent process and shouldn't be underestimated. And healthcare providers overall need to have more racial and ethnic representation. And some resources, certainly there's plenty of information on the FDA website. Also, um, many people think of this um, organization as big pharma and they're out to get us, but actually the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America is an excellent organization trying to address diversity in clinical trials. There's also the Society for Clinical Research Sites, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, some of the materials I pulled came from there and they are also excellent in terms of addressing and giving background information on DEI. Certainly the National Psoriasis Foundation um, and the Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis Alliance also has information on diversity. So thank you. And we have a few minutes left for questions if anyone has anything or wants me to clarify something I said, but uh, thanks again for your attention. So I guess if, I don't know, um, if we can go off mute or if there's um, questions in the chat, if people have any or they don't at this point. Maybe. Um, yeah. 
How do we address more of the um, diverse populations being reported on as far as the clinical trial for that subgroup? So of the clinical trial, what were the results specific to women or specific to African-Americans? So that seems like obviously you need to get enough population into the trial to report on, but how can you, how can we influence that reporting? I, I think to some degree, it's going to be a grassroots thing. Um, certainly at the sponsor level, I think those of us, for example, that work in the pharmaceutical industry that are on this program need to make a conscious effort to continue to influence that. I think all of the emphasis in the last year on diversity, equity, inclusion is really important. Sorry for that. Um, I don't know how to, sorry, uh, apologies for that. Um, I think, you know, so some of it's gonna be grassroots. I think some of it maybe to some degree, it's a horrible thing to think about, but shaming. Um, I think even um, for example, so I mentioned that much of these data may actually be pre present in the documents that are made publicly available by the Food Drug Administration, but they're not always present in a publication. So I think that the some of the onus is also on the ICGME, which I always um, mix up the acronym, but basically the International Council for Journal and Medical Editor, something like that. Um, apologies for messing up the acronym, but uh, that that group also needs to, as editors of the journals, insist upon it. Um, so I think that there are various ways. And then um, even letters to the editor can call it out that this information wasn't presented and we need to know what these information are. So I think that there are opportunities. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take awareness um, and it's going to be people like us that keep drumming, um, beating the drum to get this to happen. But um, for those of you who are not aware, I am very active as a patient research partner within psoriatic disease settings, I myself have psoriatic arthritis. And so for example, whenever I'm reviewing a grant, I always look at where's the patient representation in this grant. So slowly but surely trying to ensure that. And then similarly, I also talk about diverse populations um, in the grants that if it's not addressed, that that's um, a comment that's given back to whoever wrote the grant to ensure that they start to address it. So it's a small thing, but I think that those of us that are committed to it can keep um, our focus on that issue and make that something that becomes hopefully then a routine. And I appreciate that the National Psoriasis Foundation has also supported me in those efforts related to patient representation on clinical trial, um, on clinical research projects, as well as diversity. Great, thank you, Nevi. You're welcome. Oh, I think there might be some questions in the chat. Um, so everything is thank yous and no, no questions, but I think we're almost on the hour. So again, thank you so much to everyone for attending. I hope that this addressed some of your questions and how you might be able to even take back some of this knowledge into um, your own workplace, even if you're not directly involved in a clinical trial. And um, yeah, have a great rest of your evening. Appreciate it.